All of the major Hollywood studios have dabbled in releasing smaller independent films, and one of the longest running indie units is Fox Searchlight Pictures, now just Searchlight Pictures. Since its founding in 1994, they've released several critically acclaimed films and five Best Picture winners, while also being willing to step outside the box at times. The idea for the studio came from Tom Rothman, who started his film career working for celebrated indie director Jim Jarmusch, and later served as president of the Samuel Golden Company. When trying to come up with a name for Fox's new division, he noticed the searchlights on the 20th Century Fox logo. It was as simple as that. The first film released by Fox Searchlight Pictures was the low-budget dramedy The Brothers McMullen. The movie was acquired after its premiere at the Sundance Film Festival and became very profitable, immediately showing the potential of this new label. They released a number of films during their early years, ranging from quirky comedies to serious dramas. The studio's first major breakout hit was the British comedy The Full Monty. The movie was released during the late summer of 1997 and had incredible staying power at both the American and British box office, eventually grossing almost $260 million worldwide. For a time, The Full Monty was even the highest grossing film ever in the UK, and it also earned Fox Searchlight its first and many Best Picture nominations. Not everything Searchlight released found an audience, though. Despite great reviews, Ang Lee's The Ice Storm was a box office disappointment. However, they smartly did not go overboard on the budgets, and so when they got a hit, like Waking Ned Divine, they more than recouped that money. Searchlight finished the 90s with the acclaimed drama Boys Don't Cry, but the life of transgender man Brandon Tino, with Hilary Swank winning an Oscar for the role. They also released Julia Tamer's ambitious Shakespearean adaptation Titus, which did not play on many screens and flopped at the box office. Fox Searchlight Pictures would continue to grow during the 21st century, with a willingness to release all kinds of films and rolling the dice on several international pickups, particularly from England. Among those movies were Quills and Sexy Beast, which earned Oscar nominations for Jeffrey Rush and Ben Kingsley, respectively. They also handled Richard Linklater's first foray into rose-scoped animation with his experimental film Waking Life. Another example of a variety of films released by Fox Searchlight was when they picked up Super Troopers, a silly comedy from the true Broken Lizard. The film performed okay in theaters, but it exploded in popularity on DVD. Meanwhile, the lesbian comedy Kissing Jessica Stein and the drama The Good Girl, the latter of which received acclaim for Jennifer Aniston's performance, did well among the indie crowd. Among the slate were also star-driven vehicles. One Hour Photo got a lot of attention for featuring Robin Williams in a role many found unsettling, and the comedy The Banger Sisters, starring Goldie Hawn and Susan Strandon, did well relative to its small budget. Searchlight even backed Denzel Washington to directing debut Antoine Fisher, although not become the Oscar contender they were likely expecting. Searchlight did seem to have an incredible ability at finding British films with worldwide appeal. They handled the American release of the sports comedy Bend It Like Beckham, which found a significant audience in the United States. Danny Boyle's zombie movie 28 Days Later got a lot of attention for its digital photography and scenes of an empty London, while Jim Sheridan's semi-autobiographical In America received acclaim and multiple Oscar nominations. Catherine Hardwick's self-financed directorial debut 13 was picked up by Searchlight and got noticed for its depiction of rebellious teenagers with Holly Hunter also receiving an Oscar nomination for playing a distressed mother. I think this variety of films is pivotal to why Searchlight Pictures has been able to survive for so long. Fox Searchlight was even willing to release The Dreamers, which was rated NC-17 by the MPAA. They could have easily tried to peel it down to an R or have Bernardo Bertolucci cut scenes for the American theatrical release, but they didn't. The Dreamers made $2.5 million, which is a decent result for film that CERN Atlas refused to advertise and which never played on more than 116 screens. They saw an impressive sleeper hit with the comedy Napoleon Dynamite. The movie opened in theaters in June and kept adding screens as word of mouth among young viewers got bigger and bigger. It entered the top 15 on the weekend box office charts in July and stayed there until the end of October, even though it never ranked higher than number 8. It did even better on DVD, resulting in teenagers quoting it endlessly. Zach Braff's Garden State got similar attention around the same time, so Fox Searchlight seemed to really latch on to what young viewers wanted to see in movies outside the typical blockbusters. They scored another major hit with Sideways. Directed by Alexander Payne, the movie was acclaimed for its smart, funny dialogue and interactions between the actors. They play a group participating in a wine tasting. Sideways was nominated for Best Picture, with Payne and Jim Taylor winning an Oscar for their screenplay. Searchlight continued showing knack for picking up the right movies at festivals. They acquired Jason Ryman's first movie, Thank You for Smoking, at the Toronto International Film Festival for $7 million. The film generated a lot of discussion for its depiction of a tobacco company lobbyist and pulled in decent numbers at the box office. They paid $10.5 million for Little Miss Sunshine at the Sundance Film Festival and it became an audience crowd pleaser over the summer and eventually got nominated for Best Picture. They handled the American release of a low-budget Irish film once, which resulted in a hit soundtrack and an Oscar-winning song. And as an example of Searchlight's interest in also releasing more mainstream fare, they produced the remake of the horror movie The Hills of Eyes after Dimension Films dropped it, and that wound up a decent-sized hit for them. 
Searchlight did not leave the prestige film behind either. Leasing The Last King of Scotland, which earned Forrest Whitaker an Oscar for playing dictator Idi Amin, Notes on a Scandal, featuring Oscar-nominated performances from Kate Blanchett and Judi Dench, and Mickey Rourke's comeback vehicle, The Wrestler. One of Searchlight's other strengths is that strong partnerships with certain directors, with Peter Rice especially fostering a lot of these when he ran the studio in the 2000s. After his run at Disney ended, Wes Anderson moved over to Fox, with The Dark Jane Unlimited becoming his first film released by Searchlight. Following Thank You For Smoking, they released Reitman's second film, Juno. That was an enormous success, thanks to Diablo Cody's unique, ear-catching teenage dialogue and the charming performances from a cast that included Elliot Page, Michael Cera, J.K. Simmons, and Jennifer Garner. It was also the only Best Picture nominee that year to not have a dark tone, something even Jon Stewart noted at the ceremony, and Cody won for a screenplay. Another director Searchlight had a strong relationship with was Danny Boyle. He'd already made a few films for 20th Century Fox, but he saw some of his most acclaimed work released under Searchlight, starting with 28 Days Later and continuing with the family film Millions and the science fiction movie Sunshine. And then came Slumdog Millionaire, although that movie did not start off at Searchlight. It was originally going to be released by Warner Brothers, but they did not have faith in the movie and considered putting it out direct-to-video. Searchlight eventually swooped in to save the movie and agreed to handle the North American release. Slumdog Millionaire became a big hit, and eventually earned Fox Searchlight its first Oscar for Best Picture. Boyle's next two films, 127 Hours, another Best Picture nominee, and Trans were also released by them. They also supported directors making their first movies. Searchlight released the sex comedy Miss March from the Whitest Guys You Know comedy troupe, the romantic comedy 500 Days of Summer from music video director Mark Webb, and the roller derby sports movie Whip It, the directing debut of Drew Barrymore. Fox Searchlight's successes and unique slate will continue in the 2010s. Black Swan was a massive hit for the studio, netting them yet another Best Picture nomination and an Oscar for Natalie Portman. They also released Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life and Alexander Payne's The Descendants, two more Best Picture nominees to add to their impressive catalog. They also released Shame, which was given an NC-17 from the MPAA, and Martha Marcy May Marlene, Elizabeth Olsen's breakout role. One film that caused a bit of trouble was Kenneth Lonigan's Margaret. The movie was filmed in 2005, but Lonigan struggled to create a satisfactory cut, which led to lawsuits involving one of the producers. One version of the film ran over three hours, but Fox Searchlight released a cut that ran two and a half hours. Despite solid reviews from critics, the film did not get any attention in its release, though it did get more notice after the original cut was released on DVD. Searchlight's penchant for finding crowd-pleasing British films continued with the Best Exotic Marigold Hotel, and they scored another Best Picture nomination for the Sundance film Beasts of the Southern Wild. They had particularly good luck at the Oscars this decade, winning Best Picture back-to-back -back for 12 Years a Slave and Birdman. There was also the Grand Budapest Hotel, which in addition to receiving plenty of nominations and wins from the Academy, became Wes Anson's most successful film with over $173 million worldwide. To put that in perspective, that's about $100 million more than his second highest grossing film, The Royal Tenenbaums. The Grand Budapest Hotel is a perfect example of Searchlight's ability at slowly rolling out movies and helping them gain an audience thanks to word of mouth. Not all of Searchlight's investments have been successful, though. They had high hopes for Me and Earl and The Dying Girl, paying an astounding $12 million for the rights after its Sundance premiere. They expected it to be the next 500 Days of Summer, but it only made $9 million. They spent an incredible $17 million to buy Nate Parker's slave revolt historical drama The Birth of a Nation. However, before the film's release, stories of Parker's history of sexual assault resurfaced, and Parker's response did not put him in a positive light. After an okay opening weekend, the grosses dropped like a rock, and now the film is largely forgotten by the public. A big success for Searchlight would come with Guillermo del Toro's unorthodox romance The Shape of Water. Its love story between a mute woman and a fish man received a lot of acclaim and won the studio another Oscar for Best Picture. That same year, they also released Martin McDonagh's Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, another significant Oscar contender. They would soon release Wes Anson's second stop-motion animated film, Isle of Dogs, and the royal satire The Favorite, with the latter becoming, yep, another Best Picture nominee. A major change would come for the studio, though, when 20th Century Fox was officially acquired by the Walt Disney Company in the beginning of 2019. There were questions about whether Disney would even be interested in keeping Fox Searchlight around. After all, Disney had sold Miramax earlier in the decade, as they lost interest in releasing the sorts of movies indie divisions specialized in. Would they even be allowed to spend money to acquire films at festivals? For the time being, Fox Searchlight's agenda has remained the same. In fact, shortly after the merger, they bought Terrence Malick's A Hidden Life at the Cannes Film Festival for almost $12 million, even outbidding Netflix and A24. Although when it opened at the end of the year, it never expanded beyond a select number of theaters. Fox Searchlight did score a hit during the summer with a horror movie, Ready or Not. However, the biggest show of that strength was Taika Waititi's World War II comedy, Jojo Rabbit. 
After winning the People's Choice Award at the Toronto International Film Festival, the film enjoyed a solid box office run and multiple Oscar nominations, including Best Picture. Waititi also won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. Pretty good for a comedy about a boy whose imaginary friend is Hitler. 2020 was when Disney's influence really started to kick into high gear. First, like they did with 20th Century Fox, they removed Fox from the name to avoid association with Rupert Murdoch's television networks, turning it to simply Searchlight Pictures. Then the pandemic hit, which affected their release plans for the next few years. The most significant movie in 2020 was Chloe Zhao's Nomadland. Funnily enough, had the pandemic not happened, Nomadland and her Marvel film Eternals would have opened around the same time. As many theaters were still closed, most people watched the film on either Hulu or Disney+. Plus. That hardly hurt the movie, though, and it won Searchlight the next Best Picture Oscar, although one wonders what would have happened in a normal release year without major movies being delayed. 2021 saw Searchlight slowly release more films in theaters, although that was a year when Independent Fair had to deal with older adults being the most reluctant to return to theaters. Wes Anson's The French Dispatch was one of the better performing art house films around that time, although you still have to put an asterisk on that film's box office. Same goes for Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. 2022 saw more changes, as about half of Searchlight's films were released straight to Hulu rather than given a traditional theatrical release, including the horror movie Fresh and the romantic comedy Fire Island. Some may wince at this, but if it means Searchlight is given more freedom to make the films at once, I'm okay with it. The critically acclaimed awards contender The Banshees of Sharon and the rich person satire The Menu still got theatrical releases. The Menu was even given the widest opening weekend in Searchlight's history. And here's the shocking part. The Menu grossed more domestically and worldwide than Disney Animation's Strange World, which was released around the same time. Who could have predicted that? So what does Searchlight Pictures have coming up? Flaming Hot, a movie about the creation of Flaming Hot Cheetos, will stream on Hulu in June. Opening in theaters this summer is the comedy Theater Camp, which they bought at Sundance for $8 million. And currently scheduled for November, they have Taika Waititi's long-delayed sports film, Next Goal Wins. We'll also be getting Poor Things, the new film from Joris Lanthimos, the director of The Favourite, and filming just started on Andrew Stanton's science fiction film, In the Blink of an Eye. Searchlight Television was also formed recently, mostly to create shows for Hulu. That first series was The Dropout, starring Amanda Seyfried as Elizabeth Holmes, which was a big hit and earned Seyfried an Emmy. And they recently premiered History of the World Part II, a continuation of the Mel Brooks film. Whether in theaters or on streaming, Searchlight Pictures has developed an incredible track record of releasing critically acclaimed award winners, mainstream hits, and auteur-driven passion projects. And for the time being, the indie studio that Tom Rothman started still appears to be thriving under Disney. Searchlight is certainly one of the most impressive studios dedicated to giving us smaller, artistically unique films. See you next time.